how you all doing I'm the watchman and this is part 10 part 10 of the sanctuary the outlawed and hidden truths the devil doesn't want you to know about God's sanctuary now uh, we've been showing and I've been going over the order and the pattern and I've been doing this for a specific reason to show how God stresses the order and the pattern of his sanctuary throughout the whole Bible throughout the whole Bible and God is so great that the more the more I learn about his holy sanctuary the more I see why the devil does not want it taught does not want to talk he wants us to look at it all like oh just regular pieces of furniture yeah okay go that way but he does not want you to see the main clear-cut reasons why God has his sanctuary set up in a certain order and in a certain pattern and how his pattern so many times so I'm gonna give about a couple more examples of the order and the pattern and where you can find them in the Bible because all of this is leading up to the prophecy of Daniel 8 Daniel 8 because uh, like I said in the earlier in the earlier vid that the devil's main goal he tried to overthrow God's sanctuary in heaven what he could not do physically he attempted to do spiritually and he succeeded for a short time spiritually spiritually and this is the prophecy of Daniel 8 Daniel 8 so before we actually get to Daniel 8 I want to show this is it's very important that we get the order down automatically that way once Daniel then Daniel 8 which is open wide up because the prophecy of Daniel 8 is about a religious power attacking God's sanctuary sanctuary in these last days so this is all leading up to Daniel 8 and I really can't wait to get to that but I know we have to do it step by step because God is a God of order so right now I'm gonna show how God shows his order in a story that we've all heard many 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 times we've all read about the life of this man and did not know that some of the things that we read he was actually fulfilling the order of the sanctuary in his life and I'm talking about our King Christ our King Christ so let's get straight to it let's get straight to it turning your Bibles let's go to Luke 2 Luke 2 yes Jesus in his life fulfilled the order and the pattern of the sanctuary Luke chapter 2 and I'm gonna read verse 7 it says and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end now a manger y'all is a is a box or a, or a place where food was placed to feed animals to feed different animals in the stall now the food differed depending on what animal you were feeding it could have been other animals that you placed in this box depending on what your animal ate you know if your animal was a meat eater you place other animals in that box to be fed or grains herbs but anyway Christ when he was born he was placed in a manger in a feeding tool you know so literally Christ when he was born was laid on the altar of sacrifice was laid on the altar of sacrifice and like we say God like we know God is a God of order so watch how these things are in order and in pattern in order and pattern and we know that little is told of God of Jesus as a child you know it goes from him being laid in a manger to him being in the temple in the temple courtyard and then it goes from them losing him at the temple all the way to what to when he was baptized to when he was baptized are you starting to see the pattern already you know are you starting to see the pattern already it goes from him in a manger and when you come into the altar sacrifice you're now 
in the courtyard of the tabernacle. So it goes from him in the manger to being in the courtyard of the tabernacle where they lost him to his baptism in Matthew. Let's go to Matthew 3. Matthew chapter 3. Let's check out his baptism. Matthew chapter 3. I'm going to start at verse 13. It says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it, means permit, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. I'm going to read that part again. He says, For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. To fulfill all righteousness. Fulfill. You see how Christ? Because John was saying, Why are you coming to me to be baptized? Baptized is to be made clean from sin. And Jesus was without sin. So why was Jesus coming to John to be baptized? He was fulfilling the order of the sanctuary as an example to you and I. <laughs> Let me say that again. Christ was actually fulfilling the order of the sanctuary as a personal example to you and I. For we all know that Jesus didn't need to be baptized at all. He didn't need to be baptized at all. But let's continue reading. We're in Matthew 3, and then we're going to pick back up at 16. But I like at the end of 15 how he tells John, how he tells John, For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then verse 16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now why is this so important? Because what did we say in the earlier series? The blessing, God's blessing, always went to the second birth. The second birth. <laughs> so do you see where I'm getting at? Jesus was already alive. And then we see that when he was baptized, when he was born again on his second birth, God screams out from the heavens, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Just like you and I, when I was baptized, when I was re-baptized, when baptized, then re-baptized, you know, God said the same thing. He said, this is my beloved son. We become children of God when we are baptized the second time. So that's why it is significant how when Christ was baptized <laughs> the second time, how God screamed out from his throne, this is my beloved son. And this is the same thing he'll do for you and I when, when we are baptized the second time. When we're born again the second time, he'll say, this is my beloved son or my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. So even God is fulfilling the pattern in order with Jesus and letting us know that when you are baptized, when you are born again, you become his child. You become his child. Now, let's... Stay right here in Matthew, and let's check out the very next verse, which is Matthew chapter 4. It's a new chapter, but the very next verse, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 says, Then was Jesus led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward in a hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread do y'all see the pattern here forming for Jesus was just baptized and then he is the word says Matthew 4 verse 1 says he immediately went into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil and when he got there what's the the devil's first temptation concerning commanded these stones be made bread for let me tell y'all remember the devil knows the sanctuary in its order. So what well, that's the main reason why he doesn't want it taught. And and what he was actually trying to do was trying with these temptations in the wilderness, he was trying to get Christ to defile the order and pattern of the sanctuary. Because it was the devil, y'all, who brought up 
the bread immediately after the baptism. They're going through the sanctuary, the order of the sanctuary. You know, they're going through the order of the sanctuary. And the devil is trying to get Christ to defile or break the pattern or fail at one of the pieces of furniture, fail in his walk. You know, he's trying, that's why he, he wanted him to misuse the word of God, you know, for he was God. And if he had commanded those stones be made bread, he would be misusing the word of God for personal gain. And we know that the Bible is not to be used for personal gain. Don't you have a lot of ministers out there today who use the Bible for personal gain? The devil has them. The devil has tripped them up at this first piece like he's trying to do Christ. But anyway, do y'all see the pattern? The order went from the manger to the baptism to the first temptation being about bread. Bread. God is great. And just to throw this in here, y'all, just for y'all personal knowledge, that when, when the devil says, if thou be the son of God, see, the devil had appeared to Christ as an angel. And he appeared to him as an angel. But he showed his true colors when he said, If thou be the Son of God. For he wanted Christ to doubt who he was. Even though God just screamed out from the heavens 40 days before Satan comes to Christ. 40 days before Christ came to the wilderness. What happened at the baptism like we just said? God just screamed out from the throne. This is my beloved Son. But Satan knows that if he can get us to doubt who we are then the battle is won already and that's why the first word he says to christ in verse three he says if thou be the son of god immediately when he said if thou be the son of god jesus knew that this was the devil and not an angel who was talking to him but anyway anyway you see how it was the devil who brought up the table the bread like I said, the devil tries to get us in our walk through the sanctuary. The devil will try to get us to malfunction, as you say, as you can say, at each different piece, at each different piece. But what did Christ answer him? Christ said in verse 4, Matthew 4, verse 4, he said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And what is that? The Bible. The Bible. <laughs> the Bible. Okay, so does the devil move on to the next piece of furniture? Let's see. Matthew 4, verse 5. Matthew 4, verse 5. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If, there he goes again, if, trying to get Jesus to doubt who he is, he says, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, least at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now, I want y'all to see, before I explain how this is the altar of incense, I want y'all to see how the devil is coming at Christ with the Bible. So literally, the devil, he knows the Bible so much. And will flip it and miscue it so powerfully that he is coming at the word, which John chapter one, verse one calls Christ. John says Christ is the word. He says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He is coming at the word with the word. And that shows that showed me personally how powerful the Bible can be taken, twisted and flipped. So it is important that we understand what we read. And that is, so think about it. So that is why the devil wants to keep us numb or should I say behind on, on the sanctuary. If the word, if the sanctuary is one of the pillar access, uh, the one of the main pillars of the word if you don't understand the sanctuary which is the main pillar of the word which christ was the sanctuary in flesh then you won't understand the word 
and the devil know he can easily manipulate you. But anyway, let's get right to it. Let's get right because that's a whole nother sermon. That's a whole nother lecture. But anyway, he says, let's read it again. He says, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now, what God was, what the devil, excuse me, what the devil was actually wanting Christ to do was he wanted him to abuse his connection with God. The actual verse that the devil was quoting here is from Psalms 91. It's from Psalms chapter 91. And he also, he leaves out at the end where he says, least at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Then it says, to keep thee in all thy ways to keep me but he just left it right there because he wants Christ to abuse his connection with God break this down in layman terms remember the altar of incense the next piece of furniture means prayer communication our connection with the Lord for for when he says uh, cast thyself down for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. In their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. For God to, to have grace upon you, for God to show grace upon you, you have to have a connection with him. Your connection has to be tight-knit with God. You know, you have to be almost one with the Father. You know, so grace is only given through prayer we're only given grace through prayer if you don't pray and you ain't got a relationship with God he's gonna give you a little grace he might you know give you a little grace I'm not gonna say he's gonna take away his grace but what the devil has a lot of Christians doing today is abusing the grace of God saying well you know I can sin God will forgive me in the morning he's a great God he loves me you know, I pay my tithe, I go to church, you know, I do all these things. So if I slip up this one time, it's going to be all right. Cause, but what the devil knows that one time is going to lead to another time, to another time, to another time, to another time. But he has a lot of Christians. That's why I'm telling you, if you don't know the sanctuary and the order of love, that's why he has a lot of Christians saying, oh, we're just under grace. Mm, be weary when you say that. Because you're trapping yourself. You're trapping yourself to misuse and abuse God's grace. Because what answer did Jesus give him? Verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Meaning, don't do something just because you think God is going to save you. You're actually tempting the Lord. Saying, Saying, Father, here, save me. I have no reason. This is all for personal game. I'm, I'm just going to jump off this temple just to prove to someone that that I'm your child. You know, that's what he wanted Jesus to do, just to jump off to prove to him, to try to prove that he was God. Well, I'm going I'm to show off my connection with me and God. That is a way of abusing his grace. And also a way of abusing God's grace is by knowing knowingly sinning and saying well you know god loves me that's my that's my ace boom coon i love the lord we're, we're like this so if i do this little sin one time you know it's a social occasion so if i have a couple little drinks side you know he'll forgive me he'll forgive me you know i ain't that bad of a person that's abusing god's grace that is misusing your connection with God. That's abusing your connection with God. That's better to put that way. Abusing your connection with God. Now what's the next piece? Is the seven branch candlestick. Let's see. What's the third temptation? Now first, what we say the seven branch candlestick represents? Being a witness. Your character. Being a witness for God. Now what's the third temptation? And remember, this is the devil coming at Christ with these temptations the so the devil is actually going in the order of the sanctuary but he's trying to get Christ to defile and misuse 
the pieces. He's trying to get Christ to misuse the pieces. Okay, verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now the devil, in verse 9, he says, he says, All these things I will give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The devil wanted the worship of the Savior. The devil, basically, the devil wanted Christ to become his witness. He wanted Christ to serve him. He wanted Christ to represent him, you know, when he says, fall down and worship me, you know, Christ would have been, if, if, if we worship, if we're worshiping the devil, that means our character is in a line with who we worship. Our witness is it in a line with who we are witnessing for. God said, you either with me or against me. You're either with me or against me. So either you're being a witness for God or you're being a witness for the devil. And right here, the devil wanted Christ to worship him. You know, he wanted Christ to represent him. He wanted Christ to be a witness for him. He says, worship me. Become one of my followers. Become one of my followers. And as you see, these three temptations, which are in the holy place, are the three main temptations that the devil today comes at every Christian. And I will just reiterate real quick. The first temptation that the devil comes at a Christian, he wants you to misuse the word of God for personal gain. When he said, command these stones be made bread, you know, that you may eat. He wanted, he wanted Jesus to perform a miracle to help himself. Not to help someone else out there, but it was for personal gain. How many of us come to God just for personal gain? Then was the second temptation. He wanted him to abuse his connection with God. Saying, God, now think about it. He wanted him, Satan is so much lawlessness, wants to commit iniquity, which means lawlessness. He took him to the temple. He wanted to, to defy what law? The law of gravity. Saying, Okay, God, I'm going to jump off the top of this temple. The law of gravity says, come and sense that I'm going to fall and die. But because I know you're a great God, I know you love me, so I'm going to just jump off here anyway. I'm going to jump off here because I know you'll catch me. You said it in Psalms 91. You said it. So I know you'll catch me. God didn't say to deliberately you know, when you deliberately do stuff like that on purpose for no good reason that he's just going to do it. Because then you'll have people performing uh, tricks like that, getting paid millions, you know, jumping off buildings and skyscrapers. And all of a sudden they're not hitting the bottom, but they're being picked up and sat down and nothing's wrong with them. You know, he wanted Satan wanted. Christ to abuse his connection with God just as he has millions of Christians. I know I did it myself sometimes. I was sitting there I'll sit there and be like well you know it won't hurt if I do this one time you know God will forgive me. He's a loving God. He'll forgive me. I've said that in my head sometimes with certain things when I knew I was doing wrong but I was batting on the fact that uh, God will forgive me. If I ask him to, that is abusing God's grace. And what was the third one? He wanted Christ to be a follower of his. Many of us who claim to be Christians are really doing the devil's work and don't even know it. We really, what does Christ say about the church of Laodicea? You know, he says, he says, you, uh, you say you're rich and in need of nothing, but Little do you know you are blind, wretched, poor, naked. So these are the main three temptations that come at every Christian today. To misuse the word of God for personal gain. To abuse our connection with God. And to serve Satan and not our father. Okay, so we're, we see how Christ was born in a manger. Went from his baptism 
to commanding the stones, to abusing his connection, to being a, uh, a witness for God. But the devil wanted him to be a witness for him. He wanted Christ to be a follower of him. So what about this last one? What about this last one? I want to show in the very next chapter, because what's the, what's the next piece? We have the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, which contains the cherubims, God's glory, and the law. The very next chapter, the first sermon that is recorded of Christ. The first sermon that is recorded of Christ. As we showed that the, the Beatitudes are, is the order of the sanctuary just in different words so the people could understand it in more detail. At the end of the Beatitudes, at the end of, he gives his first recorded sermon. Is it a coincidence that he, he brings up the law where he says in verse 17, Matthew 5, verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. And believe it or not, love, beloved, this is not the actual fulfillment of them. Christ is talking about the law because he has just went from here, 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 here. And now he's talking about the law. But turn with me. Turn with me to Matthew 17. Let's go to Matthew 17. Matthew 17, and I'm going to read verse 1. It says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. I used to wonder, why did this transfiguration take place? Why did it take place? Hmm. <laughs> Let's get to it. Verse 2. Into a and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. Verse 2. And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. A lot of meat man, for, for these verses right here. Now we see Jesus was transfigured before them. Because what what do we what was the what's the whole purpose of the sanctuary? To take a fallen man from here, take him through the assembly line of God to be able to be transfigured, to be able to stand in the presence of God. Ooh, for Christ was without sin. He didn't need to be baptized. He didn't even need to be transfigured. But he was showing us the pattern of what will happen once you go through each step. We can guarantee, we can guarantee that once we reach this part of our lives where our character is formed to Christ's character and we're being a witness for God, that we will be transfigured figured into the the person the man or woman that god will have us to be to where we'll be worthy enough to stand in his presence to stand in his presence and this is why the mount of transfiguration took place and look how so deep it is with in detail there are two cherubims that stand on both sides of the shekinah glory you know on the day of atonement god's glory would come into the the most holy place and would sit on top of the mercy seat between the two cherubims and we brought that out when Israel when we show how God took Israel through the sanctuary order and right before his glory came down he said only Moses and Aaron could come and they were a representation of the two cherubims does God have another representation of the two cherubims right here what it says Matthew 17 and Moses and Elias talking with him for we know God is a God of order in particular in every detail then all of a sudden a thick cloud just like the cloud of the Shekinah glory that sits between the two cherubims uh, it says and behold a voice out of the cloud so we know this is God because he says this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased so now Christ as we see he conquered 
He was rebaptized, and he conquered. He upheld, should I say, he upheld each piece when tempted to defile the pieces. He upheld each piece, and then he was transfigured and made worthy to stand in front of the glory of God. And God gives him the affirmation again that this is my beloved son in whom I'm more pleased. And which God will do with us once God, once God takes us from here and we allow God, Holy Spirit and Jesus to take us through the sanctuary, then we will be transfigured as Christ was transfigured. That is why the uh, transfiguration took place as an example to us. What will happen once we fulfill the order and the pattern of the sanctuary, we will be transfigured and found worthy to be called true sons and daughters of God and will be able to stand in his presence. And this is how Christ fulfilled the order and pattern of the sanctuary while he walked on earth. While he walked on earth. This is why he said, I am the living sanctuary. And doesn't he say that about us too? Doesn't he say, for our bodies are the temple of God? Amen. God bless y'all. And thank you for studying with me. And like I always say, the truth loves investigation study these things on your own study pray talk to the lord about it because god is great his truth is right here right here